All right, let's see, this is thing everyone can hear me, hopefully. All right, and uh, there we go. All right, cool. So uh, thank you all for attending. I am very honored to be here, my first time in Switzerland. Um, I apologize for uh, interrupting, I think, is what the start of the uh, soccer game. So if anyone wants to shout out scores as I'm going along, I would not be offended. So this talk is titled No Silver, Silver Bullet for Digital Vampires, D DLP or Data Loss Prevention Security for Mortals. Uh, so of course we have our Blade attempt who is about to kill our, our favorite, least favorite vampire. Uh, so before I get into you know, the meat of the talk, just the requisite background information slide. My name is Kelly Lum. Some people know me as Aloria on Twitter, unfortunately or not. Um, I am a security engineer at Tumblr. I am also an adjunct professor at NYU Engineering, where I teach application security. Um, before I started at Tumblr, I've kind of been all over the place, been security, you know, officially for about 12 years. So I have worked in military, um, in government, in a nonprofit, and also in finance. So I've worked in a lot of places where DLP has been either uh, in use or something that has been considered for use, uh, which is one of the reasons why I thought it would be interesting to look into um, some of the things that are out there. So in terms of our agenda, um, I just do all these, I don't know why we did like that. Oh, nope, never mind. So first we'll just do an overview of what DLP is, why people use it, uh, how it is used, um, and we'll kind of go into the breakdown of the, the different targets that we picked. Um, when I say we, this uh, research was done in conjunction with um, a friend of mine, Zach Lanier, uh, some of you may know him as Quine. So um, he is also somebody who wrote the Android Hacker's Handbook, so he's a real smart dude, um, look him up. But so we're gonna go over you know, what DLP is, uh, what the targets are and what their com components were, uh, what the components are of those targets. And then we'll go into sort of uh, the techniques, the kind of uh, methodology that we went through in order to test and kind of put these uh, targets through the paces in terms of mostly we're, when we're doing this, we're evaluating the security of these products. You know, how, whenever you take a piece of software, a piece of hardware, whatever, put it into your infrastructure, you're uh, potentially adding more attack surface. You're potentially putting something that may be insecure into your infrastructure. So that's so a question that we should want to answer, right? How secure are these security products. Uh, then we'll do, you know, some conclusions, some like final thoughts, and then I'll open it up for questions. So why did, you know, why DLP? Why not some other product? And, and it's kind of the reason is it's, it, maybe it's this slide, sh uh, this bullet shouldn't say used to be a hot button topic. It kind of still is in terms of not ma maybe DLP, but the fear and the, um, frequency of data breaches that have been happening. You see them in the news all the time. There's Home Depot, there's Target, there's you know, um, people's password lists <laughs> getting uh, stolen or um, you know, leaked somehow. So people were like, how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna get rid of this data loss, uh, this data loss problem? Oh, here we go, here's a silver bullet, it's DLP. We throw it into our network or install it on our machines, then we'll be fine. We don't have to worry about anything anymore, okay? The way that DLP is normally sold, um, and as I'm going through this, you'll just see some news articles of, from a few years back about things that are people, people are freaking out about get their, getting their information taken from them. The way that DLP is usually described or what its utility usually is, is keeping honest people from doing dumb things. So you have uh, the person who uh, you know, goes through the HR paperwork. You wanna discourage uh, that person from putting that um, sensitive information, tax forms, social security numbers, uh, addresses or whatnot, you wanna discourage that person from putting it on a thumb drive and taking it home with them or sending it to their personal email address so they can work on it you know, while they're on vacation or, or whatnot. Um, but, and that is really kind of the way that we wanna think about DLP. Some people do worry about, let's say, like the Bradley Manning sort of thing, which we'll get to that later, but in terms of the utility of DLP, we really kind of want to keep the honest people honest. The advanced insider threat is a lot more difficult, and again, we'll talk about that later. Um, and again, the reason why people are freaking out and looking at DLP to uh, maybe let them sleep 
a little better at night is all of these data breaches that are happening. You don't want your company be, to be the next company that's on the front of you know, Gizmodo or, God forbid, the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times because you had a massive data breach. You have to inform you know, thousands to millions of customers or, or whomever that, hey, we screwed up. We, your, your stuff is in the hands of bad people. So that's why people choose DLP, and the reason that um, we decided to look at it was, again, we're curious about the attack surface. You buy something from a company, um, the products that we're looking at will range anywhere from you know, five-digit license, licenses in terms of cost to free, um, but you're, you know, you're putting your trust, you're giving um, either money or time or both to uh, getting one of these products into your organization. Um, and if the product is vulnerable, then you've made yourself a little bit more vulnerable just because of the added attack surface. We're also interested in reliability. Um, as we'll talk about some of these, with DLP, I mean, it's, the way it works is it has to look at the data that people are dealing with. It has to look at file transfers. It has to look at things that are copying and pasting. It has to maybe monitor network uh, communications for things that look shady. If those things aren't um, reliable, if they're constantly crashing, if they're making things super, super slow, that's not going to be good for anybody who's trying to get serious work done. And in addition to other security products that you probably all have worked with or are familiar with, things like firewalls, like IDS, the, the position that DLP needs to be in your organization is usually somewhere w that is very, very attractive to maybe an attacker who wants to get, in, get as much information out of your uh, company or out of your network or out of your system as possible, right? You, if you have to monitor all the traffic, then that's a perfect place for me to kind of go after to try to pop that you know, box or whatever to say, okay, I'm in here, now I can see all the data that's flowing through that they were worried about people stealing, and now I can steal it. And also, so the joke I always make is, I'm from Brooklyn, um, most people in Brooklyn are, no, like, the stereotype is we're all hipsters, and so we really like irony, right? And so testing the security of security products is kind of just a fun thing to do, it's kind of funny in a way. Also, so, sometimes it's sad, we'll get into that. Um, oh, one last thing, so uh, one of the trends we'll see when we look at some of the bigger name products is there is also this kind of trend, and you s don't see this just in DLP, you see this in other pieces, you see this in pieces of software, other uh, pieces of security, hardware, whatever, um, where the big vendor, they see, you know, like, we need to make more money, we need to be more competitive with what other people are offering, oh, look at that small company, they do something cool, let's buy them, and then they maybe buy three or four small companies, bundle them all into one big security suite, and then forget, you know, they lose all of the institutional knowledge of the company that they just bought out, right? They don't know what exactly they're rolling into their product. Maybe they're not evaluating the thing they bought to make sure it's secure. They're like, oh, well, these people said it was, it's okay. So, you know, they have a penetration test report. It's fine. So in order to talk about things that people have done in the past before we get into what we've done, um, so Secure Roses has done, you probably Google it, um, they've done a bunch of blog posts and white papers on DLP security. Uh, back in 2007, Matasano, which I believe is now part of NPC, uh, they did a talk about defeating DLP. Uh, there was also a talk at DEF CON 19 about basically using open DLP to steal sensitive data. Uh, so that was given by Andrew Gra Gavin. Uh, and there's, there were a bunch of others. Uh, this talk has been done um, in various iterations at other conferences. So this is basically, you know, we broke our research up into a bunch of different vendors. So this is all of like the complete gamut of all the stuff that we looked at. So I'm not sure, hopefully people can see this all right, but this is just an example of how DLP would sit in, uh, in terms of the DLP architecture and where it would be situated inside an organization. Um, you may have, depending on the, the product that you're using, depending on the fe fe features of the product that you're using, you may have um, s all of this, you may have some of this. So usually what you'll have in the center is a DLP management server. Does this do the little thingy? 
Oh, it does, cool. Okay, a DLT management server, which talks to a database where you're gonna keep all of your policy uh, and reporting information. And we'll talk about how you define that in the next slide. Okay, the DLT management server is responsible for taking those policies for those signatures, whatever you're looking for, and pushing those out to, let's say, let's say you have a network monitor because you wanna monitor traffic to see if people are maybe, you know, taking large files, taking files that they shouldn't be transferring and moving them to places they shouldn't be going. Uh, maybe you wanna monitor things on the workstation, such as somebody trying to copy and paste something out of a classified document or a document that has certain types of metadata, you, you wanna catch them trying to paste that into an email. Um, you may wanna look at your mail server. Again, maybe somebody is trying to send something outside of the organization or maybe receive something inside the organization that uh, has something sensitive and you wanna go investigate that. Uh, you might wanna look at your databases. You know, a lot of times, especially when we're talking about credit cards getting stolen, passwords getting stolen, somebody's going to be pulling out lots and lots of records of your database. If you can catch those records being taken out, then you, know, you may either be able to stop it or you may be able to react a little bit faster than finding out because you saw it unpasted. Another thing that DLT uses, and so this kind of is not, this usually isn't DLT, sometimes it is. Sometimes people will monitor what's going on web. So they wanna make sure that people aren't copying and pasting, let's say insider information or sensitive co corporate information into like a web form. But they'll also kind of, as a selling point, use uh, these DLT policies to say, these are the sites you can't visit. These are the, you know, you're limited to these sites or these sites are blacklisted. Uh, just as an additional, okay, well, not only do we get to protect your company from having its data stolen, but we can also prevent your you know, employees from looking at porn. So just to go more into the architecture, uh, that go from network to, to sort of how it works in terms of you have these policies that are living on your you know, management server or whatever, and wherever the DLT endpoint is, whether it's a network monitor, a mail server monitor, or a workstation monitor, it's going to be, those policies are going to be talking to a bunch of different things. So this is basically closer to where the user sits, and this is more in the back end. So what are some of the things that DLT can look at? Well, they can monitor your clipboard to make sure you're not copying credit card you know, information or social security numbers uh, somewhere. Uh, they, maybe you wanna look at your removable devices. Again, the um, person who takes sensitive documents and puts them on a USB drive um, or burns them to a DVD or whatever. You wanna monitor to see what people are doing in that respect. Sometimes you actually wanna mo uh, monitor documents, right? So if somebody opens up a classified file, maybe you wanna log every time somebody does that. You want to see if people are trying to uh, access things that they shouldn't be accessing, um, see if people are putting information into documents that they shouldn't be putting in. So you might want to indicate which files you want to look at. Maybe you only want to look at you know, Microsoft Office files. Maybe you want to look at uh, database files. Maybe you, know, you want to look at XML text. Maybe there's some binaries that you want to look at. Um, these document and file par parsers are, um, can be implemented in one of two ways. Sometimes there's a crawler, sort of similar to like an antivirus scan that's gonna look through all your files and see if there's a pattern match. Sometimes it's a real mo time monitor. So if somebody opens the file, manipulates it, it's actively looking at what the user is doing. Okay. We also have protocol analyzers. So you would say, I wanna look at FTP, I wanna look at you know um, connections to uh, weird IM services, whatever it is. So you're gonna have, um, interface with your network driver and you're going to have uh, something that's monitoring the uh, communications that are going onto your, um, over your network. Okay, the inspection engine is where they take all the information from these parsers and basically says, is this okay, is this not okay? And then you have an enforcement engine. Uh, sometimes you'll actually want to actively block something. There's some DLT solutions I've seen where you, you know, try to copy and paste something you shouldn't and it'll actually pop up and say, you're not supposed to do that. It's been reported to the, the, to the content police or whatever. And a reporting engine. Sometimes you just wanna see what's, you know, been going on. Uh, maybe get hourly, weekly, daily, whatever reports to see like this is what people have been trying to do. 
And I'll try not to go on to this kind of soft dust, this is the last one, but this is sort of just an example of a workflow of somebody who's working with DLK. So first you're gonna identify what you wanna look at. Maybe you have some keywords, uh, maybe you have like fingerprints in terms of you know, certain uh, binary data, uh, maybe you have regular expressions, right? You wanna match for social security numbers, for credit cards, for um, things that look like, I don't know, email addresses. Uh, and then you have file attributes. So the files, cer certain patterns for certain files you might wanna look at. Then you're gonna define what the rules are, okay? You're gonna say, these things are allowed here, these things aren't allowed here, so on and so forth. Once you, oh, ah, uh, okay. Once you do that, you're gonna create a policy saying, here are my targets, maybe you have different policies for different people, such as the people in the HR department are allowed to work with personally identifiable information, the people who are the graphic designers, they have different policies on their machine, they should not be looking at credit card or personally identifiable information, right? Um, you may wanna select which network channels you wanna look at, and then what, what is the, the action you wanna do? Do you wanna block it, do you wanna log it? Uh, do you want to log it silently, or, or do you want to log it and say, hey, don't do that? Um, you deploy the policy to wherever your agents are, and then you go into your monitoring, where you're looking at logs, you're looking at reports. Uh, the other thing that you can do is, when I said more like an antivirus scan, where you go and do data discovery, where you're cra crawling your systems for certain things that may be of interest to you. And again, just to kind of drive the point home, the ability to do all of this means that DLP has to be very, very powerful. It has to have access to a lot of information. The fact that DLP needs to look at your data to determine whether or not it's good or bad data or sensitive, non-sensitive data means that DLP, if somebody can compromise it, they're gonna get access to a lot of stuff. Okay, so before I go into, we're gonna talk about our targets and then we're gonna get to the good stuff, all the vulnerabilities and whatever we found. Um, all the vendors, have been notified of the findings. As far as I know, there aren't any outstanding patches that, that need to be done. Um, some vendor names have been changed to prote protect the innocent, um, just because we didn't like people saying that they were gonna say, send us nasty letters. Okay, so let's talk about the targets that we looked at. Again, we did this in two rounds. Uh, the first round, we looked at more kind of big name uh, vendors, and then the second round we looked at a little bit more boutique startup offerings. Okay, so round one, and we'll go into you know, the stuff first, but we have Trend Micro, Sophos, WebSense, and just for good measure we threw in an open source one, which is open DLP. Uh, the endpoint agents, you see that there's Windows for Trend Micro, uh, endpoint is also Windows for Sophos, um, and endpoint for WebSense is Windows, Linux, and OSX. Open DLP is entirely Linux. Uh, the management appliances, you'll see Trend Micro has Linux. Um, the enterprise console for uh, Sophos is Windows, but their uh, UTM appliance is Linux, um, which is more of the management stuff. Uh, the management server and WebSense is Windows, and their data security protector appliance, which is sort of a scanner, is Linux. So just kind of all over the place in terms of you know, the operating systems that we see. We do see that the endpoints tend to be Windows-centric, with the um, exception of web, WebSense, which supports the big three. So I won't go too much into all these, just sort of what the interesting stuff is. So they have the Windows Endpoint Agent, which does the monitoring and the enforcement. The weird thing about the Windows Agent, it actually l acted like a root tick. Basically, you install it, and you're like, where the hell did it go? It, it's not here. Basically, you install it, and it, hide it hides itself. I can kind of understand the rationale behind that, where you know, if you are kind of worried about somebody a little savvy or somebody who actually is deliberately trying to do bad things, hiding the fact that they have something monitoring them may put them into a fault, lure them into a false sense of comfort. Maybe you can catch, catch people easier. It's just, it was just a little shady looking when, when a piece of software does that. Um, can make it very, e uh, very difficult to kind of get rid of that piece of software if you, for whatever reason, don't want it on there anymore. Uh, the network agent is a virtual appliance. It basically sits on the network, does what it says, monitors network traffic for the stuff you want to monitor. Uh, there's something called a remote uh, crawler, which will basically go out and look for machines that are not part of your corporate network and try to say, well, why is this here? This isn't one of our, this is a machine that is on our network that doesn't have an agent. 
what is it doing? Why is it there? Maybe a consultant brought in a laptop, just trying to figure out what's on your network or what's um, there that shouldn't be. And the management server, you know, is Linux-based. Again, it's a virtual appliance. You, you get a VM, you install it wherever you want. Okay. So the management server uh, is this uh, management console. It's Apache Coyote on Windows and using MS SQL database. So a lot different than uh, Trend Micro, right? It's, it's a Windows-centric management. Uh, the endpoints, again, big three, so a lot more support here. Um, what do they do? They look at file and network drivers. They also monitor clipboard operations. Um, and then there's this protector appliance that has this weird restricted admin shell. We really didn't look too much about that, but um, we also have crawlers that can basically go around on systems, on, on network shares and whatnot to look for sensitive documents. Okay. For Sophos, our management console is Windows. A uh, whole lot of .NET. We'll get into, why is that showing up? Okay, whole lot of .NET, which we'll talk about a little bit later, why that was interesting. Um, it's one of those kind of bundled solutions where you get your endpoint security, so you're not just getting DLP, you're getting antivirus, DLP, and you know, whatever, for your different operating systems. Oh, okay, that's fine. Ah, I hate these slides. Why do you do it like that? I don't, okay. Open DLP is just the Linux virtual appliance. It is Apache and a whole lot of Perl. Um, I personally don't dislike Perl, but Zach was the one who looked at this and he got very, very upset at all the Perl. <laughs> it also has a Windows agent um, and it also has something that is a file system crawler and a document crawler. Um, also, you know, this SSH, FSPS crawler and also Metasploit modules, uh, which I thought was weird. I guess if you wanted to make open DLP like a payload or something, it was just very, I mean, that was an interesting feature. So one thing that we also wanted to mention was as we looked at these products, not open DLP of course, but we noticed that there's this thing on a lot of them called KeyView or KVU, which is KeyView uh, OOP binary. This showed up a lot. Don't ask me what OOP stands for, I don't remember. Yeah, you know me. Part of uh, the KeyView field is their SDK. It's used for parsing, normalizing documents. Basically, it, it makes sense that this would be on a lot of things that need to par parse documents because it's a library for parsing documents. Um, it's used in a lot of DLP products. Um, it's also used in messaging servers and a lot of big data platforms. So this is not just something that's uh, unique to DLP. This library is in a lot of places. So, you know, why am I bringing this up? Well, if you're somebody who likes to find a bug that affects a lot of things, then this is maybe something you might be interested in looking at. Okay, so for example, in WebSense, we have this thing called EP Classifier, and it basically spawns all these KVOOP processes, processes, and what it's doing is uh, creating a policy engine filter and then looking at documents that are either living on the file system or are being looked at. All right. We're almost done with the overview stuff, okay? I promise. So who did we look at? Again, we changed these names just because one, it just kind of felt like a good idea, and two, they are smaller vendors, you know. Um, we probably should have done it for the big names, but I think they can kind of handle the criticism because they have a lot of money, I don't know. Um, so we've named up Alpha, Bra Bravo, Charlie, and Dingus. Uh, Dingus because Dingus may or may not exist in the real world. Um, again, the virtual appliances, here they are all Linux. The endpoint agents are, um, wi all, wi all, all of them support Windows. Uh, the Charlie and uh, Bravo support OS X and Charlie supports Linux. Um, and let's see, do we have anything else? Th the Bravo DLP management server ha is in Windows, but the, yeah, that's the only one that has a management server in Windows. All right. Okay, so this is a slide where I'm going to get angry. Um, Alpha DLP was, how am I going to, okay. So there, I know, I've noticed in security, you're talking to security people, looking on Twitter, reading message boards, there are certain vendors and certain technologies that we kind of like, and there's ones that we really, really don't like. So Alpha DLP was just like this weird Frankenstein's monster of everything I just, makes me upset. 
first of all, it, is a, it was previously an open source product. The, per, the people grabbed the code base and basically closed off the, the code. That's not cool. The admin panel is entirely in Flash because apparently it's 1998. And the Windows agents, you know, like, I understand, you know, like, you know how, like, when, you, when you're a little kid and your mom or your dad takes you out to get ice cream and they're like, what you want on your ice cream? And you're like, I want gummy bears. No, I want hot fudge. No, I want marshmallows. No, I want sprinkles. No, I want cherries. No, I want all of them. And you're like, you get it, and you're like, I'm going to die because this is too much. So basically, I kind of feel like that's their attitude in terms of how they built this out because it's made of .NET, Java, and Erlang. And I thought that .NET and Java were supposed to be like enemies. So, okay, yeah. <sighs> and and, and just, you know, this is, this is bad enough, but just, just to make thing make you, you know, if you're not already kind of just like, ugh. It uses action message format, or the beautiful, beautiful Adobe, uh, or Macromedia, or whatever, who invented that, message message format for communication. Because the admin panel, again, it's in Flash. So why not? Yeah. Uh, Another thing to note is that they used to have an OS X and Linux endpoint agent, but they became Windows only because, you know, maintaining software is hard when a big company buys you and they lay off all your people. I don't know if they did that, but that's my theory. All right. Oh, okay. Also, the back end, this isn't so bad, but it's Apache, Jetty, and MySQL. MySQL did kind of seem like an odd choice for something that's supposed to be enterprise software, but YOLO. Okay. These are not animating, okay. Anyway, so Bravo DLP, the management console is an MMC snap-in, it's Windows based. Um, the back end is MSSQL. The content monitoring server is also uh, Windows based and it's separate from the management console. The end endpoint agent, again Windows, has a lot of drivers and hooks, uh, as you might imagine. And the endpoint agent is similar to Windows but it has less support for So the OSX agent isn't as uh, robust as the Windows one. Uh, they also use a lot of open source free libs. Hopefully they are using the proper licensing. I don't know, I didn't, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, such as Boost, uh, FreeBSD, B S D, et cetera. Oh, now, you, now it animates, right when I'm about to, okay, whatever. Curly DLP. Oh, go. I'm just gonna do all these because I don't know why it's not, all right. Are you going to do it? No? Well, fine. Okay. Um, there we go. So a virtual appliance, kind of the same theme, uh, Linux. Endpoint agent, Windows. Does file monitoring and scanning, monitors clipboards, monitors network traffic and URLs coming out of the operating system. The endpoint agent is uh, Ubuntu and Debian. It has uh, file monitoring and scanning. Uh, it has a little notification tray ring thing in the GNOME KDE that pops up and says mean things to you, I guess. The OSX endpoint agent, we really didn't look at that much, but it exists. All right, Dingus. It may, it totally is not a real thing. We didn't change the name because these people were mean to us or anything. Um, oh, nope. Oh, shit. I'm not good at slides. I don't know how to computer. I just got this computer from my mom. She put some video games on it and stuff. There we go. I think that's it. Oh, nope, that's it. Okay, good. So, again, Linux management system, network appliance is Linux virtual. Uh, that can be used in a variety of ways. One inline, you can do a tap or a span port. Uh, basically, you can use it either to monitor traffic, proxy traffic to something else. Uh, the Windows endpoint agent monitors the clipboard. Uh, it can look at the file system, and again, it can act as sort of a network monitor. All right. So now we talk about how we did this, what our sort of uh, methodology, our assessment criteria was. Again, this was less to figure out how effective these products were, although, you know, we did throw some stuff at it and make sure that it was alerting properly and working as intended. Uh, but mostly we were interested in the security of these products. Why should we spend money on these products? spend all of our time putting them into our infrastructure if they're going to be like a giant mess of security problems. Okay, so in terms of the network appliance, we're gonna run the paces for, on the parsers, right? 
what, what happens if we throw invalid or mangled files at it? Maybe we can do some fuzzing, see if, it, if the parser throws up on stuff it didn't expect. In terms of the update deployment, okay, is it encrypted? Is, are the updates you know, properly signed, properly uh, you know, um, encoded, or not encoded, encrypted or whatever? Are they using SSL? Or is the certificate good? Is, this, is their certificate pinning? That sort of thing. Um, the operating system that they're using for their virtual appliances or whatnot, are those operating systems hardened? Are they out of date? Are they using a really, really old version that if I update it, it's going to break everything? Um, is the operating system hardened or is everything running as root? Are we, um, you know, properly jailing things if we need to jail them? Are we basically running it as a less privileged user and then um, escalating privilege only when we need it, dropping it when we don't need it? Uh, for the endpoint agents, again, we're going to look at the parsers, throw weird stuff at it. Um, same thing with the update deployment mechanisms. Also look at uh, the drivers and services that they do. Okay, the, the endpoint agent can be tying into a lot of things. It can be looking at the file system. It can be looking at your um, you know, interaction with printers. It can be looking at your interaction with the network stack. So those are a lot of things that the endpoint agent can get its hooks into. We want to see if they are uh, properly handling what happens if I send a whole bunch of weird packets to this endpoint, or what if I try to open up a really, really funky file or whatnot, what's going to happen? Maybe, I send, maybe it's monitoring print jobs and I send a really, really weird print request with malformed data. Is it going to crash? Is it going to throw up? And then for the management server, most of these are web app interfaces, so our typical, you know, OWASP top 10 type stuff comes in. Uh, the database that we use to store policies and other sorts of information, we're going to look at, make sure it, that the data is stored in a good way, so anything sensitive should be encrypted. Um, the configuration should not be no password or running as root. Um, and same thing with the operating system. Make sure that we have, um, the operating system is up to date, is hardened, um, and is not configured in a way that is not considered best practice. All right, we have 20 minutes to go, or less than that. Let's just go through all of the stuff we found. So in, before I go into specifics, we're going to go vendor by vendor. I just want to talk about general observations, just the trends that we saw overall in terms of, you know, things that it seems like everybody is kind of not getting right. So the Linux appliances, we did see a, like a very big lack of hardening. You know, there, there were some things that could have been locked down a lot more. Uh, we did see things running as root where they shouldn't have been. Uh, so that's maybe one of the things that they expect you to do yourself, but, at, you know, as somebody who's selling you a solution, we kind of expected that those were a little bit better than they were. So again, a lot of services run as root. Uh, they weren't using any sort of exploit mitigation, you know, in terms of memory uh, corruption or um, code execution preventions. The endpoint agent software, again, we talked about how this stuff has access to a lot of stuff, we wanna lock it down. The endpoint agents out of the box usually ran at a very, very high level of privilege, root local system administrator. And then just general absence of best practices. Like it's just, it, we really didn't expect it to be as easy to find problems as we did. Um, you know, things where they didn't encrypt their communications, where they didn't, I don't know if they, I mean, the OS top 10 is pretty easy to find. I don't know like what, I don't know what's going on. We'll get into that. And then occasional bug inheritance. They're using libraries that um, have bugs that either haven't been patched or they're using an outdated version. Uh, we'll go into specifics when we get in the, into the um, you know, different targets. But we did see you know, people using things like outdated JREs, the FreeD, CVE, and whatnot. All right. So the part where ac people actually, the people actually came to this talk for. All right. So again, I said, you know, and again, you know, this is going to come off as a rant, and maybe this whole talk really isn't a rant, but one of the things that I kind of always expect from a vendor, especially a vendor that, you know, is asking you for a lot of money and is, you know, basically making the bulk of their profit from selling people security solutions and whatnot, is that you should not have vulnerabilities that are so obvious that an intern can find them. And these are, so these are just different pages. Some of these are reflected, some of these are uh, stored, but there was cross-site scripting all over Trendmica, which was something that I didn't even find this, my, most of these myself, I was like, no, because I was running Burp Suite, and Burp was like, this might be a, 
uh, I'm like, no, no, oh, why? They patched this, I, I'm pretty sure they patched this. Another one, again, come on, cross-site request forgery. We learned this, what, like, I, you know, oh, okay, so what, what, what can we do? You know, you can make policies or whatnot, so why don't I see if I can trick an administrator into making a policy? Maybe I make a policy that allows me to do whatever I want. Maybe I make a policy that blocks people from doing stuff they have to do. Uh, let's see if we can actually, what am I doing? Okay, this needs to go faster. But you guys all know what, and gals all know what cross-site request forgery is. So I'm just, what am I changing here? Oh, I just, so I just changed the policy number. Was it the policy? Yeah, I just changed the policy number to ODA just as a regular proof of concept. So if we go in and then go back to the panel, we should, yeah, let's go look at what our keywords are. All right, now I have a keyword list called ODAs, and I can fill that with whatever I want. I could create a policy using that keyword list. Another one, again, um, Turn Micro hopefully has, has fixed most of this stuff. I'm pretty sure they have. We were kind of looking at some of, this is their, their remote crawler. Um, so basically you say, hey, I want to, um, this is my you know, agent on my Windows desktop. I want you to crawl this and see if there's anything weird going on. Like, does she have files on her system she shouldn't have? Um, you know, does she have a list of everybody's salary or something in an Excel spreadsheet? And all that was in plain text. Which is, you know, nobody, I'm sh hopefully you just work at a company where nobody knows how to run a packet mix, never. So that was Trend Micro. Um, just really disappointing, especially for the first thing we looked at. Okay, so Sophos. Uh, Sophos was actually surprisingly not that bad. Um, they, most of the code was in .NET, so, and they were using the MS Core libraries, which modern, modernly tend to be pretty good. Database best practices, so, you know, using uh, stored procedures to parameterize queries. Uh, they were, you know, encoding their input and output pretty well, and they were using encryption libraries, which were not broken. So good job, Sophos. That was on the endpoint. Same thing came for uh, the, uh, the other manager. So they were Chiru, they, were Chiru, they dropped pri uh, privileges. We didn't see a lot of web vulnerabilities, um, just some low impact stuff like information leakage. Um, the network and login access control restrictions were, were pretty locked down too. Okay, OpenDLP, um, just a note on OpenDLP. We just didn't find a lot just because there really isn't a lot of functionality. We did find cross-site request forgery, um, which again, you know, you can create a prof trick somebody into creating a profile that they, um, you know, didn't intend to create. Um, okay, so let's talk about WebSense for a little bit. Um, as you would expect for most uh, policies, they contain, you know, keywords, regular expressions, or whatnot. But the interesting thing about these these specific policies for WebSense are they're actually they actually made them as Python pickled objects. Um, so what happens is the management server, they take, they take the, the policies, they bundle them, they encrypt them, and then they push them to the agency's appliances, saying here's the new policy, go do policy stuff, use it policy. So if we are able to, let's say I'm a local admin and I really, really hate my job or I really, really hate DLP or maybe somebody slipped me some money to do this, if I replace uh, the policy file, which is a .pick, or it's pickled object, with my custom pickled object, and you probably can't see that very well, but we're basically replacing a legitimate policy file with some bad stuff, and we were able to get a reverse shell from the protector after the policy update, and we're root. So that was not good. So yeah, if you wanna pop a machine as like an admin on this, I mean, shouldn't be able to do it anymore, but again, DLP is in a very advantageous position. Being able to do stuff like this is no bueno. Not very, it's not good, okay. So let's go into these smaller ones. Um, and I'm kind of going faster because there are a lot of them. But Alpha DLP got some things right, which is good. They didn't have any cross-site request forgery. They didn't have any, remember Alpha DLP is the one that uses Flash and um, um, a whole bunch of other stuff that we didn't like. We didn't see any uh, cross-site flashing in the, in the management application. Okay, great. Um, they used Hibernate so they're, to talk to their databases, so we couldn't find any SQL injection. What, which is good, but they didn't put any authentication on the MySQL database. Womp womp. 
also, you know, we get talked about reliability and having something on your system, something that's sitting on a lot of machines, something that these, those machines have endpoints that need to talk to your management server, having a, something that crashes a lot is, you know, basically not very good. It's just gonna make everybody's lives miserable. People hate security people enough as it is. Forcing, you know, subpar products on them is just going to make everyone hate us even more. Uh, this thing crashed harder than um, I'm trying to think of who's a celebrity who's known for like m getting into a lot of car wrecks. I can't think of one that, I mean, Lindsay Lohan, I guess. Um, it crashed a lot. I would say like at least once an hour and that's maybe being generous. This thing went down like harder than, um, what, what's her name, that boxer that got punched in the face by Holly Holm. Um, yeah, it was really bad, it, it, not good. So that was just the server. For the admin, uh, we saw a lot of marshalling between Java and Erlang, as you would have to do. Um, we did see that maybe there would be some potential heap corruption there. We didn't really get enough time to investigate, but you know, maybe something for future. But the bad thing, the thing that made me really, really upset and I started crying, I didn't really start crying, um, they're using a really, really old JRE. And I know that, you know, it's perfectly fine to never update your Java. Nothing ever bad ever happens if you don't update your Java. But this is really old. And I tried to update it and it broke everything. So, yeah, um, not good. Uh, there was also some path manipulation with the Erlang rules. So maybe you could get to the point somewhere it shouldn't be looking. Um, and they also didn't sign on their, remember, it's Erlang, Java, and .NET. On the .NET assemblies, they didn't do any signing. So, you know, if you're unfamiliar with assembly signing in .NET, basically you can put uh, some protective, you know, hashing or whatnot so that the runtime will verify the signature. If the signature doesn't match the, um, the assembly, then it says this has been tampered with. I don't want to run it. They didn't put that on there, so I was able to do this. And I think it's a fast improvement. So instead of having our whatever this, we have the threat bot, intelligent agents, global APT configurator. Um, and this is what it looked like. I just took out the vendor stuff and this is what I did to it. I basically just injected diff new, um, I mean, here I just modified strings and changed the binary for the logo, which is, which is fine. Um, but again, you could make this agent do bad things. You could basically root pit it Make, and hide inside that agent if you were savvy with .NET. Okay, down page. Okay, Bravo was probably one of the more complex ones. I'm just gonna go through the one that, um, this one real fast. It, it was really heavily reversed. We didn't really find anything, so we got really lazy. Um, they used DC ERP for agent server comms. Maybe that's why. Um, they did a lot of encryption, packet privacy, except for the OSH agent, which is all plain text communication. Oh, oops, again, this is, yeah. So pretty good, except, come on, in crypt stuff. Okay, sorry, it just keeps going. For Charlie DLP, no anti-CRS tokens. All operations are done restfully, so you can CR, CSR, why is this not working? Uh, you can CSRF an admin and delete the policy. All right, these slides are fucking fucked up. I think maybe I clicked it too much and it's just going, all right, I'm just gonna stop doing this. Um, the registration of endpoint agents is done by uh, SOAP API that does not perform authentication. And you can also inject uh, stuff into the admin console. These are our super amazing JS alert skills. So basically we um, gave it some C data in an XML file and it was like, whoop, there you go. All right, let's look at Dingus. Again, Dingus may or may not exist. Dingus may be a, fig a figment of imagination or something that came to us in a fever dream. Um, it, it's real, we just don't wanna. Yeah. So first thing, they have a support account that is totally not a backdoor. I mean, it reverse SSHs to a Eastern European con uh, proxy somewhere, but no, nah, that's no big deal. Nothing ever bad has happened if you find an Eastern European proxy. I mean, I love Eastern Europe, I just wouldn't ever wanna find my machine proxying there. Okay, five minutes, cool. Uh, same same non-password protected key on every appliance. Support can log in at root on every appliance, like that. And uh, the 
support candidates that vote for the web UI, so you basically have a reverse tunnel everywhere if you combine it with cross-site request forgery. You can also use the cross-site request forgery to do command injection. Uh, so what we did was, if you want to change the time zone, you just pass it the string of the time zone. Okay, well, why don't I just do uh, touch TLMP lol injection? And then we get a file on the system. And it's as Apache, so you're, whatever you're uploading there will run as Apache. So maybe some sort of script, that would be nice. Okay, um, we'll just give lots of sudoers that are Apache. One of them is RPM. Okay, let's install stuff. Uh, central console is on unauthenticated DB, okay. Um, the synchronization channel is just plain text Postgres. And, okay, so, all right, real fast. What about bypasses? Well, again, if you're dealing with somebody who does not, who really, really wants to get around it, it's very likely that they're going to be able to, or that, you're, that they're gonna get somebody hired into your company who is able to do it. Okay, so what can we do? We can use obscure file formats, obscure, uh, uh, obscure protocols, do weird things on the network, uh, side channels, any of you who are working at finance who use Bloomberg Terminal, they have their own chat and their own email client. Are you monitoring that? Hopefully, okay. Um, using obfuscated encrypted files, maybe doing some uh, steg steganography within those files. And then again, who do you trust? How many of your users have elevated privileges? How many of, the, of them can just go around disabling agents, okay? Um, just as a final note, because I know that there are probably, we always get people in the audience that are like, oh man, so DLP just sucks and I can't use it. And, um, this sucks, I'm like, what am I gonna do? So it still has value. Um, oh, why didn't it, oh, it's all one slide, great. It still has value, it, you know, just make sure that what you're getting, you know, kick the tires in terms of security before you actually give them all your money, but it still has value like in defense and death, right? You should have your, your firewalls blocking stuff you don't need. You should have IDS monitoring for stuff that is not supposed to be happening, such as really, really large or atypical fi file transfers. Uh, you want to monitor your side channels. Again, the example of Bloomberg Terminal, other communication systems that may be available to your employees. And then really, at the end of the day, you need to basically talk to the person who, said, who is going to use the, oh, I didn't know I couldn't do that excuse. Educate people, educate them frequently. When you catch them doing something wrong, which is where DLP should come in, come to them, be nice to them, just say, I saw you were doing this, here's a way you can do it, or here's something you can do instead that isn't gonna violate policy, get us all in trouble. Um, and again, know who your people are, take away access when they don't need it, they leave, terminate their account. I know a lot of people who forget to do that. Um, and again, audit your stuff regularly. Do these people still need these permissions? So on and so forth. And just a fast thing for takeaway, again, everything you buy, everything you put in your network can and will add additional attack surface. So you buy something or you're looking at buying something, if you can't do it yourself, see what security they've had done. Have they had their code scanned? Have they had a code audit? Have they had any sort of penetration tests done by anyone? Ask to see those reports. See, ask them if you can hire somebody to actually do some security analysis on them. If they say no, then maybe try to scratch your head and figure out what it was. I don't like the excuse, what do you have to hide? But if I'm gonna give somebody money, then they better freaking, you know, show me the, the stuff, the goods, okay? And just at the end of the day, and this is, you know, I'm just, this is the rant that I come on. You're selling me something. You're a security company. You're making, you are a security company, right? Why are they not finding these things? A scanner can find it. An intern can find it. I could probably, my mother doesn't know how to turn on a computer, but once I turn it on for her, I could probably teach her how to find some of these, okay? Um, and again, when you're considering a solution like this, you have to know who you're defending against. If you're really worried about a Bradley Manning or somebody who's already trusted, who's inside your organization, you're gonna have a really different method of trying to catch those people than just you know, the administrator who copies uh, everyone's salaries out of a spreadsheet and accidentally emails them to everyone in the company, right? And again, I mean, at the end of the day, everyone has a cell phone, you might wanna worry about that too. So we only have two minutes, but I could probably take one or two questions if there are any. That's me. The dog. 
Also, that's my email address, George Sims Approved Micronics, and I'm also a Loria on Twitter, if anyone wants to harass me. I apologize for going over. So my question is, are the agents smart enough, or have you seen instances where the files are being transferred to the management server for analysis? So you're asking if the agent is smart enough to get the, to see if it's transferring what to the management server? The, the files that you had to inspect, or the data, or? Uh, I mean, so they do, they, I mean, they, they generally do what they're supposed to do. Like, if you're trying to email something or copy something you're not supposed to, as long as you're not, as long as you're not being like super sneaky about it, it will usually catch it, right? It's good for what it's supposed to do. Um, but if you have somebody who's maybe going to, sometimes, it also depends on your policy. If somebody is going to encrypt a file and email it somewhere, you got to configure it to say, no, you're not allowed to send that, right? It, so it also comes down to people may be able to trick the scanner or the endpoint agent because you haven't properly told it, you know, all of the different loopholes that people might try to jump through. Um, would you see DRM solutions as a replacement or as an addition to DLP? So, yeah, so DRM, like if you are looking to, um, you know, if you are thinking about DLP just to kind of keep people from stealing intellectual data or whatever, um, I think it's, you know, I'm not really a lawyer or anything, I, and uh, the, the argument against DRM is, you know, it does, it is something that's being able to bypass, but again, depending on who you're defending against, it can be an additional layer of protection, you know, in, with respect to, we put this DM, DRM on there, you took it off, you've clearly um, produced evidence, or you basically, um, you basically, you know, like, changed yourself, like, you're basically like, you ba by breaking this, breaking the DRM, you've basically proven that you had bad intent or whatever, like, you did something that we explicitly told you not to do. So, again, like, DLP can catch people trying to do that, DRM, I guess, is just a different method of trying to, you know, keep people from, keeping honest people honest, rather. Oh, there's one right there. And is the score still zero, zero? Uh, did you find anything related to these scanners, how fast did they give up? Like, let's say I encrypt a file of some weird hashing algorithm I maybe invented myself. Are there any scanners that say, oh, fuck it, just let it go through, or, uh, yeah? So usually, um, so usually what would happen, it wouldn't be more of the scanner being like, I didn't, I didn't do this, or like, this is taking too long, send it through. It was more like the scanner was like, I don't know what this is. I don't have a rule saying what to do with this. All right, whatever, bye. Um, there have been instances where we did send, like, really, really funky stuff to it, and it thought it could scan it, and, but it wouldn't, it didn't fail open, it basically, usually they just throw up and crash. So, that's, you know. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, yeah. <laughs> There's one person here, and the, oh, right in front of you. So what has been the vendor response, and uh, have they uh, patched all the vulnerabilities you have reported? So there were some of them that we, we didn't get the updated version, but so that's actually a funny story is that we, you know, when we found these, we're like, we're going to report them. Why, you know, we're, we're nice people. We don't, we don't need to have a bunch of ODA rolling around. It was actually kind of difficult for some of the vendors. Like they didn't have, mo none of them had bug bounties. Um, a lot of them didn't have uh, easy ways to contact people. And in some instances, we actually had to go through support and say, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not somebody who is current, I'm not like an enterprise a client of yours, but we found something. Can you like give us an email address? So just reporting them was difficult in a lot of ways because a lot of these bigger companies aren't really set up for that sort of thing, which is kind of weird. Um, but the, yeah, once they found out, they did actually fix the stuff. Um, the ones that we could verify, at least, they did fix it. Um, so hopefully the other ones were. But yeah, it's um, we did tell everybody that we found bad stuff. So we're trying trying to be good citizens you know, despite mocking them on a public stage in front of all you people. So. All right. Cool, all right, thank you very much. Um, sorry for the going a little fast at the end, but um, hope you enjoyed it uh, and have a great rest of your conference.